And it's probably too long. So at the moment, I just have it coiled up. Probably at some point, I'll cut it off and return it. Yeah, yeah. Right now, I just have it with lawn stakes tacked across. In the spring, when it's nice and mushy, I'm going to like take a. Yeah. 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 Uh, so, you take ends, you basically kind of fill it full of sort of like insulation. Okay. Like, I don't know, like uh, wall insulation or whatever. About this much. And basically, what you're saying that happens is it keeps the water out if you got it painted, right? It keeps the water out, but it also lets it breathe out so that it's not going to get. Oh, so I didn't know about the cracks thing. Hopefully, that's like my job. Although I have I have fiber rods I can probably go 30 or 40 feet. Yeah, I don't know if we're going to have that many people. It's not just for the end of the year. At the end of the year, I think we're going to have yeah. Scott Talbot's online. Last Thursday. Last Thursday? Yeah. yeah. I was almost going to call somebody and say, hey, we're going to have a few more. Yeah. Last Thursday, probably a lot. Yeah, probably a lot. <laughs> December first weekend of December Oh, is that using the FS? What's that? That's a very, very cool part. Pearl Harbor, yeah. 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 September 7th, Pearl Harbor. So, so, yeah. so, it is, so it, that was December 4th. December 4th. That was hilarious. Yeah. And it yeah. was, it, it, it merged yeah. with the actual yeah. file system yeah. along with. You know, I'll look up my stuff and find out. And the Pearl Harbor was the first time that it was actually used to be used to be used to be used to be Okay, let me look at the DFS with the ones on the which is just a bunch of things. And you pick things like what kind of golf power you want. And I just don't have a shirt. It's just a dynamic shirt. Oh, I don't have a shirt either. File service on top of the 40 bucks, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. They can be mixed and match. I think because yeah. I think I, I don't know if I'll ever get a shirt. Well, one time they were talking yeah. about making it so you could have tears. They look really good. Yeah. You could like well, off one hot sectors to the slower mess. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. You, you heard it here. Last call. You heard it here. I bought my ten. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You bought 10 tickets. 10 tickets. Did I say what? We're looking at it. Not this year. That would be the beginning of next year. We're doing. We're doing a six test. We're going to be adventurous every other month. And out of that, a few of them are going to be in 20 minutes. 
December. It had a very December. Yeah. And then on the reeds. Yeah. What it is is the rain bubble is filled with a buffer and sudden chunk of the area. So your metadata is that I don't know. I mean, so that you're on this story like Right. Yeah. Tell them to spend the night right at night. And then one final call if you're interested in uh, 50 50 russ will harass you and then take your money yes he will <laughs> or take your money and harass you i mean you can do it any either way. Um, uh, so welcome to our uh, late October meeting. I uh, appreciate everybody who was flexible and made it out to the uh, fourth Thursday of the month. Um, I can tell you that at least through February, we're good back on our normal meeting month again for the live stream. Um, Eric's passing around some clipboards to get a sign in. Uh, make sure you get it. We're going to start, instead of trying to, when you come in the door, we're going to do it um, at the beginning of the meeting because with until tonight, we've had so many people, it's been hard to get a, a good count of people. Um, we can do a, a quick round of introductions. I think I know everybody. So Jason, NADI, I'm the president. Stefan, uh, Vice President, November 8, Whiskey Bravo. John Benson, KA8, GKG. Gary Robinson, WB8, ZGB. Gary? Well, I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> WB8KNL. Uh, W8TV, Jeff, Treasurer. KTJW, Bill from Bloomberg. Kilo, Echo 8, Juliet, November Hotel. KC8DEO, Benny. Bill, KMA, WDK. Eric, WDLM, Secretary. It's hard to get used to, Bill. We'll get there. AB8OUZ. And he's still not taking <laughs> trivia questions. <laughs> Echo, I have Mike Bowers, Bill, and I'm still blue, and I'm still clueless. So I'll try. Aaron, A E A L V A. Gary, W A G M F. Dustin, K D A E D C. Brad, K D A Q F T. Mark, Q F A Sheriff Otto, sir. K B A L K Ron. K D A B Y T Russ. All right. Um, I mailed around a couple weeks ago the. August and September minutes. If anyone has any comments on those, otherwise I'll take a motion to approve the minutes. I didn't get any feedback. Motion to approve. Got a motion from Stephen. Second. Zeke. All those in favor of approving motion or the minutes? Anybody against the meeting minutes? Which guarantees you meeting volunteers? I'm not against the secretary. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, upcoming announcements. Don't really have any, but nice. I can probably leave the slide in there anyway. Um, the Maslin Ham Fest is coming up this weekend. There's uh, information on the club website about that. Uh, it's at the Maps Museum, eight to twelve on Sunday. So, this, uh, maybe you can address this, the date for the Zoom Heil thing for Wayne. Uh, November eleventh. We'll be joining us on Zoom. We'll be at the Worcester Library, six o'clock, right? Six thirty. Six thirty. We're going to start the meeting, but I think. Six thirty. Six thirty. Yeah, we're going at six thirty. And you can and, and we on Zoom or YouTube, hopefully. If I'm doing right. And Mark is moving to the library, right? Yeah. For their meetings. Moving to the library. So if anybody wants to make the the okay. meetings for Mark, they're going to be at the. The way, it's the Wayne County mm -hmm. Library in Worcester, right? Main, uh, Main, 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 Main County Library in Worcester. Yeah. 
and it'll be at 6 30 all the time because we have to get out of there at 8 30. yeah so that's veterans day all right uh treasurer's report mr treasurer all right, uh, as you can see, you have a uh, beginning balance, 613520. Um, we did take in some 50-50 uh, raffle uh, money. Uh, we did have some outlays for uh, repeater um, maintenance and uh, new gear, 75-amp uh, charger converter and breakers, and also uh, SCOM and Masterscom repeater upgrade. And the last thing was uh, some club dues. Uh, ending balance, 514087. Any questions on the treasurer's report or a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Stephen, motion to approve. Second? Second. Benny? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Benny opposed. All right. Uh, executive committee report. We did not meet on September 12th, and I remember making this slide and said, I got to go back and change the date, <laughs> and I didn't. We met two, three weeks ago now. Right. Um, we, uh, uh, mostly was focused on the uh, discussing the new committee model for Sarah. Um, we're, we're well underway with that. Um, I, I have uh, some follow-up slides on that. The other thing we did decide as a club is now that we're large enough, we did decide to get um, uh, not equipment insurance, but the liability insurance as a club for when we have activities, if we're out helping someone, you know, when there's an injury or you know, something like that. Um, the club now has a, a full liability insurance when we're when we're having a function as a club. Um, with the new committee structure and thinking we're going to be doing more activities and things like that, we decided it was probably time to uh, behave like a grown-up organization a little bit. So, not that grown-up though. Just just a little bit. Just a little. Bit. A little bit more. Uh. Technical committee report. Um, I the SCOM is largely programmed. Uh, I have a couple little tweaks still to make to it. Uh, I'm still looking to see if we're going to be able to move Gary and Russ's girlfriend into the control yeah. cell for if we'll run that uh, a different way. Um, <clears throat> planning on a mid-November cutover to that, and that's really going to be solely driven by when I can get half a day to make it out to the repeater site to do that. Um, they, that will be announced in advance that both the repeater will be offline and we're going to set up a time uh, to dial in the uh, new squelch board and set up just to make sure we have that well tuned. Um, some of the all-star codes may change. That's TBD. Um, I got to, because we may end up doing something where you have to dial one code to send the DTMF codes into all-star rather than just try to have them fight over which codes are which. Um, so that may change TBD. Um, uh, we're still trying to work on the, the um, basically the 148 megahertz uh, interference, uh, hoping to get out to that property here in the next couple of weeks. Um, that is very annoying. Um, if you hear that crunch noise on low or far away signals, that's that's what it is. So. Um, and then we're still working through the uh, 275 desense issue again. That's just people we haven't had time to get out there to do it. Um, the prevailing theory at the moment is that something went bad with the preamp, but that's just a guess because that's the best guess we've come up with. <laughs> so, all right. Um, Chris, I, I I wasn't sure if you were going to be here. I didn't know if you had anything you wanted to say on the operations committee, or I can cover it. You got it. You got it. Yeah. So so Chris, um, as you know, is our is our chair of the new operating committee. Um, you know, he's he's uh, he's recruited a group of people already. Um, I think he's got. Uh, he is up there? Twelve. I think he got twelve on the list plus himself. Um, so we've got a really good group ready to do some. Uh, activities um, the focal points as we talked about before um, you know nets obviously that's always been a kind of a staple with us that the net functionality um, for everything but the barometer net is going to kind of fold into um, what Chris is working on um, operating events um, obviously we talked about you know field day winter field day simplex contest of how QSO party um, we're going to start having more operating events where 
either we get together as a full club or maybe in a couple locations, you know, but we're going to, we're going to start to operate some events as a club, um, you know, provide some MCOM and area support. Um, you know, we're not going to replace, you know, the, the different county areas groups, but maybe, you know, help them, you know, staff events, things like that. You may be playing out some exercises, you know, basically provide some, some support to those organizations. Um, there's a strong interest um, in kind of a assistance and hands, helping hands kind of thing. Um, we've got a lot of influx recently of people asking for help with antennas and things like that. So that's something we're going to look at exploring within the bounds of what's reasonable for us to, to, to safely take on. And um, contesting, you know, uh, Javen, for example, really big into contesting, you know, contesting can, doesn't have to be the high pressure super, I mean, you can, just, you know, you can make some pretty fun contacts because everybody's on the air during some of the big contests. So this is really about, you know, recognizing the opportunity to make some contacts and, and jump it in there, too. Or if you want to turn into Javen and Zeke and Jeff. And yeah. That's also, you can do that as well. So uh, any questions on the operating committee? This is not, if you're still interested, there's always a room for more. So don't take this as being out of it. All right, um, educational committee. We have a new chairman. It is a squirrel. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was looking out in the window when I made these. Uh, we we had previously announced that Jeff was going to take this on, but um, after some consideration, he decided he really doesn't have the time to do it effectively as he would like. Um, he's fairly busy at work. I don't know. I've heard there's, there's this work thing where we have to make money and you know craziness like that. Um, what so. It's, it's called dead work. <laughs> the thing that those of us who aren't retired still have to do. <laughs> um, so we will be looking um, for a new educational committee chair. That we're going to have to have an executive committee meeting. We're going to discuss how we're going to do that. So um, the education committee is going to be a little bit on hold. Um, so uh, as the executive, committee, we're still going to start. We're still going to get the 2022 presentations and some of those things teed up. Um, so if you're interested in that, that committee isn't dead. We're just, we need to find a, a new uh, leader. So, and if you're interested in that, please let me know. Or we can follow up the squirrel. There you go. Uh, social activities committee. Uh, we are going to be having the Christmas party. I think the tentative date is the second Thursday in December, I think is what Gary said. Um, no details on that. We're still working it out. Um, Social committee is also in, in charge of apparel sale. Um, so, Gary, it's really weird on this monitor. <laughs> There's like little bars and stuff breaking everything up on the actual slide. It's just really strange. Nice. Um, <clears throat> uh, so, fall winter apparel. Uh, the um, these are probably going to go on sale, I think, next week. It's going to be a short window to buy to get it delivered sort of before Christmas, I guess, if you want to buy yourself a Christmas present. Uh, I think that's Gary's plan. Um, we're still working out a pricing on some of the some of the jackets with all the supply chain stuff that's going on. I mean, I'm sure everyone's noticed if you go to the store, it's like half empty. The custom apparel business is not immune from those. so. Uh, we're still trying to work out pricing and, and what we can actually reliably get. Um, there are going to be um, a couple of different kinds of jackets. There's uh, Gary's going to re-offer the lightweight one with kind of the sleeve, the white sleeve stripes, um, or a, a heavier winter jacket. I don't think it's going to be like a full-on winter jacket, but it's a heavier, it's like a heavier jacket. Um, a zip fleece and a sleeveless zip, zip fleece. There's going to be a short and long sleeve t-shirt, a sweatshirt, a quarter zip fleece, a hoodie, a zip hoodie, and a uh, knit cap. And I still haven't seen my coffee mug yet, that Gary promised. He has it on the first list, but I didn't get a picture of the coffee mug. So we'll see about that. Um, but that'll, that'll be in the normal way we do it. It'll be on the club website. Um, keep an eye on your email because I don't know that we will still have the sales open when the November, the next November meeting rolls around, or that's going to be the very, the very tail end of it. So, 
Um, if Gary's listening, hopefully I conveyed his apparel update. I got a, I got more slides from Gary, I think, than I had for the rest of the meeting combined. So uh, I appreciate that while Gary's partying down in uh, Florida for his uh, his guys week down in Florida. So um, that was really all that I had for the business meeting. I mean, we're kind of running out of year, uh, reformulating some stuff for next year. So I didn't really have a whole lot of topics. And everyone loves a short meeting, or at least a short business meeting. So um, does anyone have any other topics for the group before we move on to our technical presentation? Yeah, I, I had a question for uh, Jeff. Um, can we still steal that extensive uh, outline that you set up for uh, the business of the education bank? Oh, taken right. by the Unfortunately, squirrel. I had all that copyrighted. <laughs> we, 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 gave it to, we gave it to the squirrel. Yeah, the squirrel's got it now. No, you're welcome to all of that. I'll send that to you. I know, um, that was, you did a lot of work on that. So. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, anything you got, you're welcome to. Or the squirrel. Or the squirrel. Yeah. And the squirrel. Maybe. Yeah, and the squirrel. We have one coming up uh, next two weeks. Two weeks. Two weeks from now. Two weekends. Two week two weekends. Two weeks from now. Two weekends. November or December sixth, I think it is. So the test. Yeah. Fourth. The fourth. Saturday the fourth. The fourth. December the fourth. Yeah. Yeah. Any other business? Move to adjourn. Eric moves to adjourn. Before we do that, Russ, draw our ticket, please. Time. Well, first of all, you might want to have all the time. Time. I told you the bucket was back there. Yeah, shake it up, man. Shake it up this time. Pour it on the floor and then put it back in the bucket. <laughs> this is how we win. Now they'll be on the bottom. Pick the lucky numbers. Now. Yeah. Jason's not in there, so yeah. Jason, I got a bunch in there, and I don't want to. Oh, okay. So I got to pick yours. Yeah. Shake it up, man. Uh, we're doing a little extra mixing here. Stir it up. All right, we've got seven, eight, zero, four, zero, five, four, four, zero, five, four. You know, when we were at the picnic, I told you I was the ticket reader. Four zero five four. Here, Russ. Say four zero five four. We've got four zero five four. Seven eight zero four zero five four. Mark. There it is. Mark. All right. Awesome. Yeah, Mark. Everything's coming up, Mark. Today. It is. I know. I know. See, you guys. That's what I told you guys. Yesterday was a bad day. Today is a good day for me. Everything was happening. Everything's coming up, Mark. All right, we put it to $80. Anybody know what half of 80 is? 40. Uh, 72. Uh, Boy, he jumped right on that 40. one. <laughs> All right. We, love uh, you, we do have a motion to adjourn. Next meeting, regular time, third Thursday of the month, 7 p.m. in this room. Uh, Tom. Next week, month. What? I won't be here next week. Oh, I'm going to change it then. Well, Mark, you're going to miss the ARL Ohio section manager, Tom Sly. Uh, he's out in Portage. Uh, my, he, uh, my AA is down right there in the University of Berkeley. Food and everything, I'm going to be there. Uh, well, <laughs> they, 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 have food. they have food and we don't, so I, I get that. Um, but uh, Tom's going to come out and talk a little bit about the Ohio section, kind of his uh, first year as uh, section manager and, you know, a little bit about, uh, I think he's going to do uh, HFQRP operating, I think he's going to talk about. So should be a good time. But we do have a motion on the floor to adjourn from Eric. Bill seconds. Anyone opposed to adjourning and learning about time? No, we're learning about time, Russ. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Um, we're going to we gotta switch out a laptop, but uh, Eric, WD8KNL, uh, has graciously agreed to talk about uh, WWV time synchronization. It looks like we've got a show and tell yep. appliance on the yeah. floor, so. It's, it's a static so. display. So give us a minute, we'll swap them out, and uh, we'll be up with Eric. It's got some money. Everybody sign in. Yes, if, if, did everybody sign in on the sheet? Yeah. If you don't sign in, we don't count you, and then you just should feel bad. You got Oh, yeah, I didn't sign the sheet. <laughs> <laughs> I feel bad. <laughs> you don't feel bad. I actually don't.
I know you. Because don't. I read the minutes and I'll put myself in there. <laughs> Thanks, Russ. Okay, I'm out of here. You are? Yeah, I'll see you later. You're not going to watch the time example? He doesn't have you know, time for time. Time keeps on slipping. Slipping, slipping, slipping. slipping. Into the future. Into the future. <laughs> Down that and broad. That was one too many time puns. I'm in a bottle. Too many time puns. Eric, hurry up. You've got to shut down the bad time puns coming from the room here. The sun dog. That would have been great. Hard to read at night. Scott, Scott Yonley said hello to everyone, by the way. So, I don't know if it all fit on this. The uh, thing, the thing, the time, the time machine. Oh, look at that. Look at that. Perfect. That's like awesome, man. It's so like it's a static display tonight, but that's an atomic clock. It's like, it's like you meant it. I, know. I, uh, I chose not to want to plug it into the library. <clears throat> so why we could do our own version back to the future. Oh, you're running big, sir. Brave man. Brave man. I won't even put it on the college yet, but we have a few. Yes, it is. Don't go to the next one. I'm waiting. Do not go to the next one. Because I ain't going to hear any crying from anybody in the world when they go to the next one. 13? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, try um, it. Oh, it's still good. Okay. So while, while the computer is uh, booting up, all right, guys. So while the computer is booting up, I brought in the show and tell. This is a atomic clock. It's a time and frequency standard. It's rubidium. It's not a cesium standard. But I have a tendency to collect stuff like this. I don't understand. It just happens. But uh, we used it to synchronize radio equipment. And the physics package in a rubidium standard is quite interesting. They excite the rubidium atoms that are in a little vial. And that causes a change in its how much light is transmitted through that. And then it's a servo back to change the crystal oscillator and the rubidium. And that's how they, they phase lock to that. It's, I'm really giving you a quick and half time <laughs> wrong, but it's pretty cool. Do any of them operate on francium? Francium, no. No, I don't, I don't think I've ever heard of a francium reference. That's what Eric's working on in his basement. No, I've got yeah. uh, I've got his big brother in law. He's got to power his geochron. So <laughs> So far we're doing okay here. Well, that was quick. Yes, it was quick. <laughs> and we're done. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and we're out. Succinct and to the point. Okay. I love that. So, love that. Timekeeping in WWB. There are probably a lot of people in this room that know what WWB is and have listened to it. When I was growing up, we always had receivers in the house. And that was one of the first things that I could listen to because I knew where to find it. I knew what it sounded like and I would listen to it. And I still listen to it to this day. Often in the mornings, it'll be on in the background. It just, it's just me. I can't help it. So, but there's a, there's a really great story behind WWV and we have to start with timekeeping. So what is time at a basic level? What is time? It's on my side. 
We're back to music again. Yeah. <laughs> Not the deep philosophical Thank question, you, yeah. but what is time? It's a human creation for one thing. Okay. What do we do with it? Worry about it. We divide the day up, right. right? And why do we do that? Because the earth rotates, the sun illuminates, and that terminator moves across the, the land, changes propagation, but that's another story. And so we divide the day and the night. It's a it's a logical thing because you know early humans they noticed there was a difference. You know, they're looking around, it's dark, they can't see anybody, and now it's light. So something's going on there. But how do we measure time? How do we measure time? Well, the early early the ancients, it was again. It was astronomical, where the sun was, the planets, the stars. Again, because the Earth is moving, and they could see that change. So there was also then the development of timing devices: water draining out of a bucket, a candle burning down. Um, there was a Chinese uh, water clock. It was very elaborate. It was made for an emperor. But then we did come up with clocks. And the essential elements of a clock are, and this is where I was going to use Andrew, an oscillator. And I was going to have him jump back and forth and somebody count him. Oh, he'd love that. I thought he would. But a, an oscillator that has a regular periodic cycle and a counter. That's essentially what a clock is. And that can happen with a pendulum or a spring escapement or quartz crystal vibrating or atoms. So this is a reconstruction of a Greek water clock from the third century BCE. More recent, is, is that, have any of you read about this clock, the Harrison H1? It was on Facebook, I saw it. Yeah, it's, there's a very interesting story about this. So the guy that designed and built that clock was a woodworker. And Remember, we talked about the Earth is rotating, right? And so knowing where you were, if you were a sailing nation, was very important. And to find longitude, one of the ways you do that, and especially at this time in history, was to know what time it was at a reference point. Then you could take your sun reading, look at your clock that you're carrying that's set to the reference point when you left, and you know how many degrees west or east you are but that's the reference point that wasn't understood fully yet so the the british government set up a board of longitude to determine and to develop the best way to determine longitude and one of those ways was with a clock set to a reference point which in this case was greenwich england there were many others the royal observer uh, the observer royal i believe that's the way they tied one he wanted to use, I think, the moons of Jupiter or something, and it was it could be done, it was doable, but you had to be an astronomer and you had a lot of tables that you had to go through. Anyway, John Harrison developed this clock. It's a marvel to see. I've been able to be there to see it. You aren't, at least when I was there, I was not allowed to take photographs, but it's gorgeous. It's a wonderful piece of work. And these beams, they're offset. And he knew enough to change, use dissimilar metals so their temperature coefficients cancel each other out. And remember, this is going to be on a ship. It's in 3D motion all the time. And so it could still keep time accurate to one fifth of a second to, per day. So he developed several other versions that became smaller and they became like a large pocket watch and they, you know other marine chronometers but it's a fascinating uh how, what, how long do you think could take polar graph of uh, a threatened and might be stone oh i don't think any is going to carry this away <laughs> you never know this is I, a couple hundred pounds i know but <laughs> hey i go i went to a museum where they come with my camera and there are certain places where they have a sign saying, oh, yes. in the museum saying, can't take no photograph beyond this point. Yes, well, this is one of them. 
They're 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 rightfully very uh, proud of that. But it's a gorgeous object that has been created. Where where is it? Uh, Greenwich, England. It's the Royal Observatory. Oh, it's, Greenwich. it's at the Observatory. Yes. Museum. Yes. Uh, so speaking of the Royal Observatory, on the roof is this red ball. It's made of wood and leather, and Remember we said one of the ways they knew what time it was is they watched the sky. And if you had a clock, and if you're on a ship, and this is what you use for navigation, how do you set the clock? What do you set it to? So at 1255, excuse me, at 1255, they raised the ball. And then at 1 p.m., they dropped the ball, just like the New Year's Eve thing that we do in New York. And all the ships that are out in the port can see that and they drop that at exactly one o'clock do you know why they do it at one and not 12. because the astronomer has to take the sun reading at 12. that's the high point of the sun's arc so they have to do that reading set their instruments and then they can drop the ball why don't they use a cannon shot it so wouldn't yeah it probably wouldn't matter that much if you're in the harbor down in the Thames, you know, what is that, a couple seconds? But still, that is that is one of them. Later on, they established these things in other port cities like Portsmouth and around the UK, and they were connected by telegraph. And so they would synchronize by telegraph to these other places so they could the ships could set their clocks as well. So in 1901, the National Bureau of Standards was established in the United States, and they were charged with maintaining standards of measure and other technical measurements, volumes. And one of the interesting things about standards, we don't think about that, but if, have you ever gotten like a little cheapy voltmeter from some faraway place? So you're measuring your circuit, it says you're drawing an amp. Who says it's an amp? How do you know? We assume that it's actually being accurate in its measurement and it's conforming to the standard of measure. That's what a, a, the National Bureau of Standards is supposed to do. In 1904, they bought this clock from Reifler in Germany. And this became the United, United States standard clock, the time clock for the United States. The pendulum swung in a vacuum chamber and, that it, and then it counted up the, uh, the oscillations. And that was the national standard until 1929. In 1929, they instituted this short, long clock. And it's very curious in that the first, the primary pendulum is in a vacuum chamber, but it's also a temperature compensated. And it's pulses are mechanically linked to the second pendulum that the clock mechanism actually counts. They wanted to, they wanted to isolate the primary oscillator from any of the mechanics. So it's kind of like a, a buffer for the clock mechanism. And that was accurate to about one millisecond per day, much, much improved. So this is alleged to be cesium clock number six. I think it's a laser potato masher, but I'm not sure. <laughs> it also yeah. comes equipped with the 1970s uh, color arrangement there, mm -hmm. the orange, that's pretty cool. The wall color, yeah. But a cesium clock, now you're talking about instead of mechanical oscillation or a crystal oscillator, a cesium clock is relying on a fundamental behavior of the atom itself. It's inherent. The frequency is inherent. So the cesium atoms are excited. They go up an energy level, and then they come back down an energy level. And in the process of doing that, they release a certain amount of photons. So the oscillations can be counted, but it can't change. It can't vary because it's inherent to the element. And that is not a cesium fountain. That is a very large cesium beam 
clock. The current clock is, I think it's like cesium, I don't know what to call it, but it's, it's a cesium fountain. If you can picture a chocolate fountain at a wedding, it's like that, except you don't dip the marshmallow in it, okay? So they excite the atoms, they go up a column that's chilled, it's laser chilled, and then the atoms fall down and they're able to count with cross count. Uh, they illuminate on the side with cesium uh, lasers and they count that fall back to the lower state of energy. So now we're talking one second in 400,000 years. That's pretty good. We can we get problems because of this. Well, we'll never really know. No. <laughs> well, we'll come back. We'll come back to that. What it, what it, what time is it? What what time is it? <laughs> what speed does your car go? What speed does the car go? Yeah. What scale are we using? What reference are we, oh, yeah. we using? Okay, so units of time. The Egyptians came up with the idea of using 12, dividing the night and the day into 12 parts. Interestingly, the daytime parts were longer than the night in the summer. So daylight savings time, it's their fault. The ancients, the Greeks thought about dividing the day into 24 equal parts. The Samaria, Samaritans, Samarians divided the circle into 360 degrees in about the same time. The Babylonians and the Greek astronomers applied that concept because they had the concept of as they're watching the stars and the moon and things go by, they were getting the impression that the earth is moving. So it made sense to apply the 360 degree circle divisions to the earth, how they viewed out from the earth. The degrees were further divided into 60 minutes and then 60 seconds. So we're down to the basic unit of time that we use is a second. Now, Come back to your comment. How long is a second? Well, it gets weird. So before 1960, in the United States, a second was merely a fraction, uh, 80, 86,400 of a mean solar day, still tied to astronomical observation. In 1960 through 67, they came up with this thing called an ephemeris year. And they picked, a, they picked a year, 1900, because they could map out actual day lengths from 1900, and they came up with a number. And then they divided that number and came up with this division, a definition of a second. That's fine, except now we're coming up to where we have clocks that are pretty accurate. They're not varying. They're very precise. And in 67, they redefined, and this is not the National Bureau of Standards, it's the International Standards Body, but the, the second was redefined as so many cycles of cesium-133. Now we're really in trouble. But let's talk about time scales. Again, we go back to what time is it? So we, a lot of us grew up with GMT, Greenwich Mean Time. I can hear my dad talk about it. He explained what it was. What do you mean, 24-hour time? Never heard of that before, but GMT. That's based on mean solar day, the average solar day. So now we have another definition or another time scale, UT0, which is raw, uncorrected astronomical time. UT1 is derived from UT0, and it's corrected for the polar wanderings the Earth does. UT2 is derived from UT1, and it's corrected for seasonal variation in rotational speed. Getting pretty sticky. So the International uh, Standards Body, which is based in Paris, it's a large group of international uh, scientists and labs and they came up with international atomic time because now atomic timekeeping is pretty widespread among the various time labs. UTC, we think of as an, 
an equivalent to GMT, but it's not. UTC is a paper time scale. It doesn't exist anywhere except when they say what it is. Because UTC is corrected for all the error and the slowdown of the Earth from international atomic time, I think it's about 37 seconds different. And that includes something that we'll get to called leap seconds. But they try to keep UTC with leap seconds inserted within 0.9 seconds of UT1. And the reason for that is if you're a, a navigator or just general public, you really want to be able to reference the time, what you see on your watch or your clock, to what do you see outside. You're not really, you want, this is what where we live, right? It's, it's relational to what our environment is. So they try to keep UTC fairly close with adjusting it by inserting leap seconds. But it is different from an international atomic time. GPS time. This, is get, this gets weird. GPS started life on January 1st, 1980. There are no leap seconds inserted into GPS time. GPS time, last time I checked, it was like 14 seconds different. Maybe it's 16. Your GPS receivers, maybe you've got one in the car, maybe you've got a handheld one for hiking. They might actually show you a corrected UTC time because GPS sends out the offset from its GPS time scale to UTC. Depending on what your GPS receiver does, it may give you GPS time, which will be different, or it may give you correction factor added already. It depends on the software and the radio. I've actually I've actually measured it on a different model of that, and it's raw time. And it's, cool. it's kind of interesting. But while we're on the subject of GPS time, you all remember that deal with Y2K? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. So there was a lot of public angst. There was a lot of talk about it. And in our industry, we weren't concerned about the communications networks because they don't care what day it is. The core functionality wasn't an issue. Some of the administrative things might have been, but it wasn't going to affect whether we got a call through or not. However, that box, its cousin, I had several of those, uh, the model before that deployed in a very sensitive system. And what they didn't talk about during that 1999, GPS only knows how to count up to 1,024 because that's how they set up the fields when they defined the way it was going to track things. So as far as its weak number, it could only go up to 1,024 weeks. That started in 1980. So on August 21st of 1999, that's when I was sweating the bullets. I was out at my sites. I had my crew out at my sites because on August 21st, at zero hour, 24 hours, it's going to roll over. And we know nobody knew what was going to happen. It wasn't going to affect everything. Now, the radio system didn't care about the date, but what it does care about was very important. This is a time and frequency standard, so I get 10 megacycle reference out of there, and I get one pulse per second, and it's dead nuts on one pulse per second. And the concern was, at the moment of rollover, is that going to be an event that's going to shift any of my clock pulses? And if so, how long? And we were ready to perform a cold restart if we had to. And that was going to be not insignificant for the people that used what we had in the field. Fortunately, it just rolled over and it didn't care. But nobody talked about this. And it's happened again in what um i think i wrote that down 2019 in april 2019 it rolled over again and it's going to happen uh in 19 point 19.9 years i think it is 
Anyway, so it's just an interesting thing. There's something called GPS time that's not. I'm just wondering if the company is going to make more money again. You know why? Uh, when they knew that QYK was happening in that 1999 and turned over to 2000, it got passed right by. And the only people who really made out ahead on that the generator was the company. They sold everything you can name, flashlight, everything. Yeah, but but you know that. The big money wasn't there in flashlights. The big money was software services mm -hmm. for yeah. things that were in the field. Yeah. Or, you know, like, yeah. Cobalt programmers. Hey, let's yeah. hear from Cobalt. Yeah. 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 I just, I just threw know, away our PT coding sheets not long ago. Cobalt, yes. Moves, yeah, like, moves spaces to detail line. line. OK. So these are just different time scales. and. Like I said, UTC is corrected because we have to have leap seconds because the Earth is not steady. It's slowing down. So any astronomical reading, the international time scale and UTC were set together at one point. And they've been going along, but UTC lagged behind because the atomic clocks are keeping correct time. So UTC, they bring up with leap seconds so that astronomically it's fairly close. So the last leap second was applied December 31st of 2016. And you get a treat tonight because you get to see the one that was applied in 2015. This is the big brother to that. And unfortunately, the audio is not going to be very good because I didn't think at, at the time to record the audio such that I could broadcast it in a group. I just did it for fun. So this is sitting on top of my spousal unit's dryer. And she wasn't too happy about that, but it's science. I don't, did you get any audio out of this at all? You can turn it on more. Yes, sir. So watch there. Yeah, so, yeah. You don't normally get to see something goes 0, 60. 60. Yeah. So nice. That, that was a leap second being applied. So now let's talk about time signals. We've got clocks that are accurate. We have time scales that we can adjust so they are relevant. But we've got to disseminate that information. If it's just in a lab, what does it, it doesn't do any good. You've got a watch, you've got clocks at home. So we saw the we saw the ball drop, church bells. Villages used to ring the church bells to signify the time. Way, way back, factory whistles. For those that are in education, school bells. I was just thinking about this not long ago. And it's like Pavlovian response there. <laughs> Gotta be somewhere. Telegraph. Jeez. So telegraph stations used to send time messages out to their stations down the line. And then there were also other signaling methods to synchronize clocks. And finally, radio. And if we're about anything, we're about radio. And that brings us to WWV and WWVB. This is a picture of the Fort Collins facility. But they didn't start out in Fort Collins. They started out in Washington, D.C. And there was a su quite surprising. They used to broadcast music because the National Bureau of Standards radio labs, they were early development. They did early development and research work in radio. And for us, we don't think about it this way. It's just a, a, a known thing. but. Radio was a kind of a big, mysterious, new thing they were trying to understand. So this is a picture of the Radio Lab in 1920 with what they're transmitting and receiving loop antennas. They had their first scheduled broadcast, and they were concerts in 1920. This is WWV now. And they would announce it in the paper. Friday, we're going to have a radio concert, a concert of the air. They used to broadcast USDA market reports. 
the agricultural department wanted to send that information up and they just have to have a radio station over at the uh, National Bureau of Standards. Later on, the post office took that over hmm. because the post office had a radio network for airmail, early airmail navigation. So those guys were flying through clouds and it was a little, little uh, less sophisticated than we would think today. So they had radio beacons that they would home in on and stuff like that. But anyway, post office was involved in that. This is a very interesting picture. So this is how they were doing their music. I have been wanting to know that Victrola, the pickup's an acoustic pickup. It comes out on a little horn underneath the, the mechanism there, but I don't know how they managed to get a microphone to get the electrical pickup get into the transmitter. I think that would be kind of interesting. And I wonder if they developed something because microphones at the time were pretty kind of up big and ugly. So you weren't gonna, you're probably gonna cut a new groove with a microphone of that time on that uh, tone arm. So this is from the Washington Evening Star. Harry B. Gibbon was listening in on general wireless messages the previous evening on his amateur radio set when he is startled by the words, hello there. He turned to see who was in the room with him, only to discover that the words had come through his headphones. He was so unexpected of a voice. He was listening to code, he was whatever, but somebody was talking, and it was it was the National Bureau of Standards WWV doing some radio experiments in that particular night. He happened to be listening. So it was uh, it made the news, the paper. This is one of their developments, the portaphone. Now, I don't think anybody was lining up outside the door to get the portaphone 13. <laughs> nice. But it is interesting. They also did some early work and they developed receivers that only used house current instead of the A and B batteries, which were common then. He doesn't look really happy either. No. <laughs> looks very solid. He didn't get a good plan. Maybe. No data minutes. Maybe. <laughs> He's out of range. <laughs> no bars. <laughs> so, so maybe bars meant something yeah, else. Yeah, probably. So here we are in the 1920s. We've got a huge thing going on. Radio is taking off. It's becoming more than just experimenters. The end of 1922, there are 570 commercial stations on the air. Good and bad. Stations were assigned in the 1,000 kilohertz band, which is the RAM broadcast band we know today. They had difficulty staying on their assigned frequencies. The frequencies were moving around on the transmitters, but the listeners, the public that's trying to listen, their receivers can be tuned, but just because it says, you know, you guys all maybe had radios that said Radio Havana, and there was a little mark there. Well, that doesn't mean anything if the thing's not calibrated, right? So they had no way to do that. So they had a problem. Stations were assigned in every in 10 kilohertz channels. So a 1% frequency error puts you on top of another station. And then the money kicks in. Mm -hmm. Broadcasting was going to be a limited industry if they couldn't keep the stations on the frequencies that they were assigned to. And if you're the National Bureau of Standards, that's an opportunity. That's what your mission is. So they were founded in 1901. They were responsible for disseminating, for distributing the means for compliance. They had been doing calibration of wave meters, which was a device that stations could use to measure their frequency. I'd never used one. I think they're probably not real precise, but that's what they had. Unfortunately, with 570 stations and a lot of people needing to have that wave meter calibrated, they were just not set up to do that. So they had uh, committees and they felt that what the best solution would be would be to have transmitters on standard frequencies that were regularly broadcasting or on a known schedule. The stations could then use a receiver and use that as a means of a reference to adjust their own frequencies. 
So the first scheduled standard wave broadcast was March of 1923. And it was weekly and it was announced with press releases. So I think it's kind of interesting to think about that, you know, you get a press release to say WWB is going to be on whatever this wave band is for uh, such and such a date. And they had a standard voice and CW message that was uh, always, always said what wavelength they were on for that particular transmitter. So that started out at the radio lab in DC. The ARRL thought that was a great thing. And the ARRL actually worked with the National Bureau of Standards because what we have to keep in mind again is this is very early in understanding the radio phenomenon. And so ARRL and the National Bureau of Standards radio section, they did tests to try to understand radio fade and propagation to get a handle on what was going on with that. So the ARRL is pretty happy about uh, WWB with their reference signals. This is a picture of one of the four national frequency standards. That is one big 100 kilohertz quartz oscillator in its uh, thermal container. I remember 100 kilohertz quartz oscillators in Drake, you know, my Drake receiver that was, you know, a long crystal, but that was about it. That's a big Goonie guy. The other thing you got to remember is quartz crystals was kind of a new technology then too. It wasn't a real, real well understood. They knew they did, they worked, they knew they oscillated, they vibrated, but developing the idea of how they cut the crystal, how much pressure they put on the crystal, how much the temperature changes the crystal, how much loading changes the crystal. You see where I'm going with this? You have to be really careful with this guy. So not only is it got to be thermally care, uh, isolated and stable, but how they load it could change the frequency. You know, we have trimmers in our radios, or we used to. And we have to manage that. So <coughs> they moved their facilities to Beltsville, Maryland in 33. This building burned down at one point, and they moved to a slightly different location in Beltsville. This is the, built, the building they built during World War II at the new location. That is a really nice transmitter room. Mm -hmm. Doesn't that just look, you just want to go in there and just sit down and go, ooh, that's radio. So this is Beltsville in 43. Okay, so the idea with WWV was to provide a frequency standard, a frequency reference. We haven't talked about time yet. But they, they wanted to improve it. And so they decided that a lower frequency signal at 60 kilohertz, and they had one on 20 kilohertz too for a while, and that lasted up to like 71, 72. Why do you think a transmitter at 60 kilohertz would be an improvement over one at 10 megahertz? Or 5 or 2.5? Coverage. Coverage, you're, you're getting there. Yes, coverage, but something else. Multiplier of the wave. It's, it's more stable. It's ground wave. It's not going to be bouncing off the ionosphere at 60 kilohertz. At the other frequencies, at the upper frequencies, you're going to have phase variations all over the place. So this would be more um, stable reference. Even though it's a lower frequency, you think of you want your frequency reference to be a higher frequency because of the multiplication. Because an error at 10 is a bigger error at 800, right? So the 60 kilohertz is a more stable RF reference. So they decided to institute the WWVB out in Colorado, partly because they moved the radio lab in a reorganization out to Boulder. So the experimental station was actually in Boulder. The problem was Boulder's right up against the mountains, not going over the mountains. So they figured they could move out to Fort Collins. They bought a big patch of land out there and the soil is perfect. It's for you 160 meter guys, great conductivity in the soil. You've got a real ground right there. So, yeah, there you go. 
And let me tell you, I'm sure one of those station engineers has used one of those antennas on 160. He didn't tell anybody, but they, I'm sure they did. So anyway, they moved out to Fort Collins. Uh, this is the diagram for WWVL, which was 20 kilohertz, and then also the 60 kilohertz station. They dropped WWVL on 20, and they rearranged the antenna, so there are two of those antennas. And they're marvelous to see in person. You just want to hook something up to them, your own stuff. They're monopole antennas. That's the top hat. That's the capacity hat on the top. So in the center, is this a laser pointer as well? Probably turn things off. There's a line going up from the helix house. That's the center vertical element, and everything else, those cables are the capacity hat to load out the antenna. And then the helix house is a, a really big coil. It's the loading matching network for the antenna, and it's all automated because they do get icing out there, and that changes the loading. So they use both those antennas now on WWVB. They actually use one transmitter per antenna. The antenna, both antennas together, are about 58% efficient. So they deliver about 32, 37 kilowatts to the array and they get an effective radiated power of about 70 kilowatts. You can hold up a scope probe. You're going to get 60 kilohertz. My daughter lives like a mile. I see the beacons from their patio. This is the site layout of WWVB and WWV. Off to the upper right are the uh, WWV antennas. Those are all half-wave verticals made out of tower, and then the WWVB antennas. These are antenna parts for WWVB's uh, big array. This is a picture from the top of tower one. You can just see the cables for the capacity hat going out. It's really pretty impressive. And this is another picture of one of the uh, little WWVB. Yeah, when I first went out there, I thought the red and white posts were the antennas. Those are just the structures to hold the antenna up. Can you imagine the forces that are on those cables? Mm. That's got to be some serious loading, physical loading. OK, so WWV is on 60 kilohertz. It went on the air July 4th, 1963 at 4 kilowatts. They added time code in 1965. Somebody figured out it was probably be a good idea to disseminate the national time standard. And WW or National Bureau of Standards and NASA and there were some other groups, academics, developed the coding that was used. They used BCD, but the way they modulated. Interestingly, WWV did not get the time code till later. And the bit order is reversed from WWVB. So one of them is least significant bit first. The other one's most significant bit first. I, don't, I didn't see any reference to why that was. It just, it just is. In 2012, they changed, they added a modulation scheme to the WWVB transmitter. The way they send the codes out, the time code, if you have a radio clock, almost 99% sure it probably uses the old standard AM modulation. It's, it's, they drop the carrier for so many cycles and they raise the carrier by so much percentage wise and that's how your radio clock detects the BCD data. They added BPSK modulation to set the time code with forward error corrected got them an 18 dB gain in performance. And I can tell you personally, I got a clock that used this time, this uh, modulation scheme. And I took it out of the box. It's probably four or five in the afternoon. I'm below grade in my family room. I put the battery in and the clock, it just started ratcheting up and it synced. It was astonishing. And I've got 
a few computers that are usually on, plus a lot of other hardware going on. So there's a lot of RF noise down there at that the frequency range. And it was uh, very impressive. It works great. But it's very hard to find a clock that uses that. There's only one manufacturer that makes the silicon for that, at least so far. You can find kits. There's a guy in Canada that sells the kits. Today, their effective radiated power is 70 kilowatts from both antennas. And now we come to WWV. So they ran out of room. They thought that probably would be a good idea since they got that big site out in Colorado that it would move WWV out there because it put it more or less in the center of the United States. It made it more better coverage throughout the United States for the, the uh, other frequency references at the time. So the antennas are halfway verticals made out of tower. And every one of them is uh, just like that, except there's one, and I'll show you a picture of it. You can see that 2.5, 20, and 25 are just 2.5 kilowatt. 5, 10, and 15 megacycles are 10 kilowatts. I could only hear of 20 megacycles this afternoon. So it was a band up. I wasn't on them. I wasn't on. I just had that up. There was an x ray burst. Really? 20 was coming in. Not, I couldn't hear anything else. Nothing else. There was a big, there was a big x ray. Interesting. Interesting. So here we go. You can't tell me that the, the station engineers were having a great day that day. Now, whether they it was a, actually a project or they decided, you know what, we got some time. Why don't we make a, another antenna? So this is a circularly polarized 25 megacycle antenna they had on experimentally for a while. In 2019, they had their 100 year anniversary because WWV's call sign was assigned October 1st, 1919. Do you know the history why we call them call signs? We never do, and we just don't think about it. But in the telegraph days, you had telegraph operators and stations all along down the line. Each one of those had the designator. That was their call sign. If you wanted to send a message, that's how you addressed it. It carried over when radio became a thing because telegraph was used, telegraphy was used. So anyway, these guys, the radio club out there set up outside the fence because it's federal property and they can't actually do this inside, but they're all, they all work there, most of them. The fun part was in 2017, I and AL7OP, all we know and love is Dave, and uh, UTW, we, we loaded up in Dave's van and we went out to Wyoming to watch the eclipse totality. And when we were going to go out there, Rick built a multi-band crystal radio set so we could sit outside the fence and listen to WWB direct. And we did that. And we were right out where those vans are. So I actually worked these guys. I worked the special event station on CW. And on my QSL card, I mentioned that we had been outside the fence with the crystal radio set. And I got a real nice letter back with this, this card. And they sent me a bumper sticker. And it was, it was kind of fun. But listening to WWV on a crystal radio set outside the fence, and we strung a piece of wire there, the fidelity was amazing. It was a stunt. You could hear the data. You could just hear it. It was so uh, well produced. So that is WWV in a short amount of time. Are there any questions or comments? It's, it's an interesting area. When I was starting to go out to Colorado, it was like a moth to flame. I always ended up on County Road 53. Do they uh, offer tours? No, not. They, the last tour, I think, was the 2016. But since uh, the 9-11 thing, they're real fussy about that. And they don't have the money. You know, they would, one of the budget allocations proposed over the last couple of years, they were going to cut funding for WWB and VB and shut them down. It was a, it was a proposal that never happened. Uh, they, they just don't have the time or the money to do that. 
I would like to, to say that they could. It would be a lot of fun. But you know, if you've ever been to a radio station, yeah, it's interesting, but it's going to be a rack of equipment. You can't touch anything. They'll tell you what it is. So you know, it's a little, it's a little like that. But it would be fun. I'd like to go out to, to see the antenna, to walk around the antenna. Have you ever come across good plans to build your own reference clock to listen to WWV and pipe it into a? Um, there are plans. Not to WWV. You could. Uh, there are plans to do like a GPS disciplined oscillator. Yeah, I've seen those. I wanted to actually get WWV and pipe it right into a pod yeah. as a strata one clock. Yeah, I think there's got to be a way to do it. Yeah, the way that's coded, it should be movable. Yeah, yeah, I just I haven't found a good way to interface. I mean, you can get the radio and you can be coded yeah, signal, so, but how but do you? Here, here's the thing. The so when you say a stratum one, then it's going to be a stratum one because it'll be a primary clock on your network. Right. Well, but, that's what I mean. Yeah. But if you're using WWV, there's a maximum rate there's a maximum accuracy you can achieve that may not be you know maybe 20 milliseconds because you still have radio propagation and if you're on wwv you've got ionospheric hops so it might be coming from this bounce this second this second this cycle this minute it might come from a different path so your clock's going to be noisy too and you don't want that there's a, I'm sure there's a way to do it. Be, be something. Maybe you would do diversity reception. I have a couple of old Kenwood hybrids that you have to dip in the plate and load. Yeah. And the only way that I, the only time actually that I've ever used uh, that setting on the radio was to calibrate the dial. Oh yeah. Uh, because uh -huh. it didn't have a DRO at the time. Uh, but I didn't hear anything actually come out of it besides telling me what, what the frequency was at to calibrate my dial. So when you put the calibrator on on your radio, it's actually not doing anything with WWV. It's actually got its own crystal oscillator in the radio, and it's going to throw out uh, radiation every one, usually 100 kilohertz. So you can dial down to zero, check it, adjust it, dial up to 500, check it, adjust it. That's what it's for, but it's not tied to WWV at that point. You zero beat. Yeah. WWV well, well, you could you could zero beat WWV. That's correct. So you could do that if you could receive WWV. If you're on a you said a Kenwood hybrid. So if we're talking like a 520. 520. I've got a 520 and 530. Did they even go to 510? You know, did they go down? I don't think no, they no, tuned no. WWV because they weren't general coverage receivers. I don't know. I know a lot of the radios back then. Well, in the 60s and the 70s, you, you had that capability. But like my Drake's, you could do yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. I don't. I don't remember if the Kenwoods actually tuned any of the WWB frequencies. I don't know about. The Ken you I've could probably that. tune CSU Canada, which is uh, like 38 something, and I forgot what their their 40 meter frequency is right now. 70, and they moved from where they used to be. Yeah. They, yes, now. that's right. That's right. Is but, Hawaii still on WWB? Yes. Just last week, I actually was copying Hawaii. And what's fun about Hawaii, it's a duplicate station of WWV. They're on the exact same frequencies. They use a female voice instead of a male voice. And the female voice announcement is preceding WWV's announcement so they don't interfere. Because they're on exactly the same frequency and because they use precise frequency standards and because they have exact time, they don't heterodyne at all. That's spooky when you hear it, as you said, there's no heterodyne. You have no on. indication that it's two completely different radio stations. Separated by, Separated by thousands of miles. Right. right. It's, they yeah. are zero beat. Yes, that's exactly right. They're perfectly zero beat. Absolutely. Yeah. Any other comments or questions? Yes, Gary. I'm interested more in the historical. Back in the 1950s, uh, Bell Telephone produced a series of educational films, and one of them was called About Time. Okay. Uh, if you can find that, it might be on I'll look. I'll look. Uh, Very interesting. About Time. So here's a trivia question for everybody before we close out, and you led me right to it. 
if I say it's about time, it's about space, finish it. It's about two it's about of the human race. It's sometimes. about two men in a crazy, crazy place. place. Yeah. It was an old TV series. Yes, it was. Yeah. It was a bad TV series, but it was about time. Yeah. So astronauts got in a time warp and ended up being back in Stone Age, and the series didn't get good enough ratings. So mid series, they ended up going Stone Age back to modern times. But it's about time. I can hear the the music. Oh, just a throw throwaway thing, but FL Digi does have a WWE mode that's used to measure the offset of the sound card. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So if but you want to measure your offset, you can. You, you can measure it, but it doesn't make, I guess you could adjust your computer clock. Right. There's also a there's also a little adjuster. If you put it on there and you let it run over time, it'll give you an accumulator That'd be and you cool. can adjust the. Yeah, uh, yeah. The thanks. That's, I forgot about that. I'd seen that. OK, well, thanks. Any other comments, questions? It's fun. It's just one of my enthusiasms. I've got two of those and a big brother. So I got time. How much you cool. Well, this. Okay, so it used to be expensive. I mean, I used to be in calibration. Oh, okay. So, so I would run around with spares in my the back of my company vehicle, and I always thought, pity the poor soul that rear ends this car, because yes. this insurance company is going to get a really big surprise. It's not the car. Uh, the big brother was fifty thousand. I don't know what these were. Probably comparable. But if we sold them, it was probably seventy-five. I don't know. <laughs> because our motto is the price goes up before the name goes on. <laughs> They're very expensive. Yeah, you, they you can get, if you want to build your own, you can get the rubidium oscillator module for a couple hundred bucks because cell towers use yeah. them and they come out of service yeah. regularly. So, you know, this has got the GPS mm -hmm. discipline and it's most of this is also buffer for getting multiple outputs of the timing and the reference frequency. <coughs> you don't need that. You just need the rubidium reference. It'll give you the one pulse per second and the 10 megs. It won't be GPS discipline, but you can make a pretty nice station standard with that. Did, did those use iRig too? Or you just uh, do that doesn't use iRig, no. Um, we do a lot with iRig. Like, we have some in our systems that do iRig, but we don't. We really don't. It's not. We don't care what the absolute time is. We want to make sure the one pulse is the same here as it is there, and that the frequency is correct. Yeah, see, we care about absolute. Time. Right. Right. Well, you're, yeah. You have something to do with like keeping the the power and phase. I've heard, I've heard people see, like that. Yeah, I know. It's weird. Weird. Yeah. So. Anyway, it's fun. So I enjoyed uh, putting it together. But thanks for that idea on Bell. Bell used to Bell system used to do a lot of great stuff. If you want a great book, it's called the it's either the Idea Factory or the Factory. It's all about Bell Labs, and it's a fascinating book because they did a lot of basic materials research that we take for granted. Everything we have technology today is built on that research. It's an idea or invention factor, something like that. That's all I have. Good night, gentlemen. Did you have another question? Thanks, sir. One more question sure. for you. Um, on the, uh, the time scale slide, yeah. you did not mention Zulu, and I was wondering how that related to UTC. Okay, Zulu is just a, a, a shorthand reference to 24 hour time that is based in Greenwich at the zero meridian. No time zones. When you say Zulu, you mean no time zones. Um, quick comment, time zones. Anybody know where time zones originated? The railroads. Railroads. Trains on tracks can't be using different clocks. Uh, not, not, not well. Eric, with all your time stories, does that mean you're related to like Z? I'm always. I can't. I can't. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, uh, I get nearly physically know. sick when I enter a room and there are clocks. They're never the same. Right. So <laughs> just bother. I used to love the, uh, the set clocks with the. Uh,